Smells like a tar ball to me. I mean, it is just still stinky, stinky stuff. It still amazes me that that stuff is still just right under the surface. Today, on a special edition of This American Land, oil just below the surface. But this is not the Gulf Coast after the BP oil disaster. This is Alaska, more than two decades after the Exxon Valdez spill. Even with those lingering toxic effects, will offshore drilling soon begin off the Alaskan coast? What's the balance between energy, the environment, and native traditions? And their climates are different, but their concerns are the same. Alaska and Gulf Coast residents share their experiences with devastating oil spills. All this and more, now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Turner Foundation, the Daniel K. Thorne Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust. Hi, and welcome to This American Land. I'm Bruce Burkhart. And I'm Caroline Ravel. We've got some terrific stories ahead on America's natural resources, its landscapes, waters, and wildlife. This week, a special show on Alaska, oil spills and the future of oil drilling in that icy, desolate environment offshore. It was 1989 when the Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound. And as the locals described it, the world changed. Gary Stryker has our story on the disaster that's not over yet. It's been a long time since anyone has hauled in a herring catch to the fishing village of Cordova, Alaska. On the surface, Cordova is a tranquil town, but you don't have to dig too much to reveal its turbulent past. Cordova is about 160 miles east of Anchorage, nestled on the eastern end of Prince William Sound. R.J. Kopchak has called it home for over 35 years. I was part owner of a fisherman's co-op and uh, we were having bumper years. The value of permits was up, the value of salmon was way up, and we were all making 80 to 100,000 bucks a year working hard, but uh, there we went. The good times felt like they might just last forever, until one day in 1989. March what, 24th, uh, the tanker Valdez ran aground and, and uh, the world changed. Enough oil spilled from the Exxon Valdez tanker to cover 1,300 miles of coastline and 11,000 square miles of ocean. It was the worst environmental disaster in U.S. history up to that point. Countless numbers of animals and birds were killed from the toxic oil. And fish populations crashed, including herring. This driver of the economy, herring, no longer is there. The herring's gone. The big hit in the herring population also hit Kopchak hard. He calculates it cost him over half a million dollars. Today, Kopchak works for the nonprofit Prince William Sound Science Center. Scientists there study the Sound's ecosystem. That includes efforts to restore the herring population. It's been the parasites and disease both that they're holding down population recovery. So While some fish and animal populations have made a return, much of the oil that was spilled into the sound was never recovered. So where is it? Oil can still be found in virtually every protected cove and beach uh, just under the surface. You just have to dig for it. It's a half hour float plane ride from Cordova across the sound to the marshes of Knight Island. So this particular area is known as the Death Marsh. And during the oil spill, it was really incredibly thick with oil and was a place where a lot of animals, birds, fish, otters, met their demise because of the oil spill. You can see the oil beginning to seep into this pit already. But let's see what we can dab. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's, that's thick, 
That's thick oil. Smells like a tar ball to me. I mean, it is just still stinky, stinky stuff. It still amazes me that that stuff is still just right under the surface. That is still there. No one knows exactly what risk the buried oil poses to the surrounding environment. What is known is that it will be around for a very long time. It's just tragic. More than 36,000 migratory birds, including at least 100 bald eagles, were killed in the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989. When most of us think of Alaska, we think rugged, intense, and full of opportunity. Now, that was the case with the gold rush of the late 1800s and a century later, construction of the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. Alaska is now dependent on its oil for a huge portion of its budget but a global population thirsty for that oil is taking a toll on the state's natural resources and on many of its residents. On Alaska's North Slope, life is on the edge. Winters are long and dark. The sun stays below the horizon for two months a year, and the temperature stays below freezing for about eight. The North Slope borough is made up of eight communities, most of which sit along a 500-mile stretch of Arctic coastline. For those who live here, the cost of almost everything is expensive. Because getting almost anything, or anyone, in, out, or between these communities usually requires a plane. The uh, borough, which is the equivalent of a county down low 40 is 89,000 square miles. And uh, roughly, we equate it to about the size of the state of Minnesota. The population of the borough, currently about 9,400, is mostly Inupiat Eskimos who have lived here for centuries. In the last few decades, it's also become home to very productive oil fields. Oil pumped out here is sent through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline for consumption in the lower 48 states. Oil companies have made billions here since the 1970s, and both the North Slope Borough and the state of Alaska get tax revenue from the companies. Thanks to our ability to tax, where we have our own schools, we have health clinics, we have airports, roads, landfills, we have jobs. Having oil go through the pipeline is critical for state coffers here in Alaska. 90% of the state budget here is built on the oil that flows through that pipeline. It's a boon for Alaskans, too. Instead of paying state income or sales tax, each resident here receives an annual oil dividend from Alaska's government. As long as the oil flows, so does the money. But four decades of constant drilling are taking their toll, and the North Slope fields are producing less oil each year. Less oil pumped out of the ground means less oil flowing through the pipeline. And of course, the worst case scenario is that the pipeline becomes unusable at some point. As the pipeline ages and oil flow declines, there are greater operational challenges. Reduced flow can cause problems with ice and corrosion, requiring increased maintenance. If that pipeline isn't pumping oil like it's supposed to, and so it could affect jobs, it could affect the way of life that we've grown accustomed to. The Inupiat have inhabited the harsh Arctic environment for more than 10,000 years. The ancestral Inupiat crossed the Bering Land Bridge from Siberia. So where does Alaska find more oil to keep that pipeline flowing? The answer takes us to the city of Barrow, the largest community in the North Slope Borough. It's the boundary point between the Chukchi Sea to the west and the Beaufort Sea to the east. And there happens to be enough oil under the waters offshore to keep that pipeline flowing for years. But it also threatens a way of life. Bobby Batista has our story. For centuries, the Inupiat Eskimos have called this their home, Alaska's Arctic coastline. One of their small villages, Kutzebu, lies just above the Arctic Circle on the shores of the Chukchi Sea. 
Like everywhere else along Alaska's North Slope, the majority of people in Kutzebue are Inupiat. They have adapted to life in this harsh Arctic environment, learning to live off what the land and sea provide. Our ocean identifies who we are. It sustains us with food, medicine, clothing. So it's really important for us to make sure that our waters continue to sustain us. This is our, um, our Costco's, our Sam's Club. This is our grocery store. A subsistence way of life, eating what you hunt or fish to feed yourself and your community, is an important part of Inupiat culture here. It's both a tradition and an alternative to the high cost of imported food. Nearly 60% of the Inupiat diet is from marine mammals or fish they catch in the Arctic Ocean. And it's been that way for millennia. Even though there's not a lot of people up in the Arctic, these people are living an indigenous way of life. They um, subsist for their food. Hunting and fishing is, is their life. And um, that way of life is very, very rare in our country as well, and we need to protect that. It's hard to imagine there could be a much more lucrative way of life to be had from these waters, but there are potentially billions of barrels of oil under the seabed offshore. The Shell Oil Company, which wants to drill for that oil, claims there's 27 billion barrels, enough to power 25 million cars for 35 years. That kind of materiality is really a game changer, uh, not just for Shell, uh, not just for Alaska, but for a nation that's desperate for new sources of energy and frankly, new jobs. Our region is divided. Of course, we wanna have jobs for future generations. We need to have jobs to sustain our livelihood. And there's also our subsistence way of life that we have to deal with as well. Drilling for oil offshore means noise and air and water pollution and the ever-present risk of an oil spill that would stress this fragile ecosystem. And with the 2010 Deepwater Horizon accident in the Gulf of Mexico fresh on everyone's mind, the Inupiat don't want to see images like these in their backyard. How would an oil spill affect the natural balance in this icy but fragile environment? No one really knows. But what is known is that marine life here has adapted to sea ice, especially in the winter and spring when it's most prevalent. It's icy and cold, but it's clean. And a major oil spill could devastate the conditions that allow wildlife to survive here. We have polar bears, uh, walrus, ice seals. These are species that are threatened by climate change and need to be protected. No animal is as central to Inupiat life as the bowhead whale. Like the Inupiat themselves, this long-lived mammal spends its entire life in the Arctic. Its massive bow-shaped skull allows it to break through the thick ice. The bowhead whale is central to our culture. It's uh, what has provided for us over the centuries in way of providing fuel for heat, and light and uh, giving us uh, the food that we share with the whole community. Yeah. Right. Yep. Whaling Captain Crawford Putkatuk keeps that in mind as he gets his crew ready for the first hunt of the fall season. It's a humbling feeling to be able to continue our, our way of life that we've practiced for so many years. Right before we go, huh? Father Lord God, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to go out. Careful regulation by international treaties and Inupiat tradition ensures that the bowhead population is sustained. Their numbers have been climbing about 3% each year since the 1980s. In planning for offshore drilling, Shell says it's determined to understand the offshore ecosystem it would be working in. We also have marine mammal observers in aircraft so that we can chart uh, marine mammals that we see, whether they're polar bears or walrus, uh, whales, or anything else significant that we can track and use as part of our baseline science. But is that enough? 
Critics point to a government study that calls for more research on a range of questions from the effects of climate change to how to clean up an oil spill in ice. The Inupiat also want more research. They've lived here for centuries, and their knowledge would be an asset to scientific studies here. Their understanding of the Arctic e ecosystem needs to be incorporated into the uh, way um, these decisions are made and if, when, where, and how development should take place. Right now we're working with Shell on trying to gather and identify needed information from a scientific point of view uh, on offshore because the Chukchi, the Arctic, is the least studied ocean in the world. Science alone cannot clean up a spill especially in shifting sea ice in the extreme and remote conditions of the Arctic. That requires good infrastructure, ports, boats, and equipment, what the North Slope is badly lacking. And who would be responsible for cleanup? We believe the Coast Guard should be far more involved since they are in charge of the spill when it occurs. They should be aware of what the individual industry contingency plan says, and they should be involved in determining if it's adequate or not adequate. We want Coast Guard up here. We don't have a port. We don't even have the facilities to support an oil spill. Shell says it's sparing no expense to fully address those concerns, just in case. We designed and purpose-built an on-site, 24-7, oil spill response fleet that consists of booms, barges, tankers, helicopters, anchor handlers, icebreakers, everything we would need to respond immediately in the unlikely event of a discharge. Shell says its cleanup kit includes an empty oil tanker called the Nanook to take in any oil leaking from a spill in the Arctic. All the vessels in the kit would stay on site with the well at all times. Having a few vessels nearby is nice, but look at the Gulf of Mexico. You had a huge number of deep water ports, all kinds of marine capacity in the region, and still it was very, very difficult to respond to. Oil spill response and recovery in the Arctic is much different than what we saw in the deep water Gulf of Mexico. Industry assurances are little comfort to others living along the North Slope. An hour's plane ride out of Barrow will reach the much smaller coastal village of Point Hope. Offshore drilling is also on almost everyone's mind here, including Steve Omatuk. This is his aunt's old home, a structure made entirely of whale bones. These are whale jaw bones, whale shoulder blades. You might have whale rib bones somewhere, but most of it is all jaw bones. Every two bones you see is one whale. Our houses. Our graveyards, our feast grounds are made of whale jaw bones. It is the center of our lives. We don't want to see this activity out in the ocean. We want to ensure that the future generations hunt the same animals that we've always hunted. You know, we want to pass our way of life to the next generation. Judge us by what we say. Judge us by the investment we made. Judge us by how we act but also judge us by how we're listening to you, because we are changing our program as a result of concerns by stakeholders. Meanwhile, Crawford Putkatuk finds choppy seas make it impossible to find a whale today. We have some corn, but fresh caribou that my mother-in-law made. So tonight, caribou stew is served at the dinner table instead. In the future, Putkatuk says he will confront the question of oil drilling by sitting down at the negotiating table. We need to make sure we're at the table to voice our concerns, to work with industry, work with the government regulators to make sure it's done responsibly. Industry is starting to listen. Native leaders were relieved when Shell agreed to stop operations during the fall bowhead whale migration, at least for now. All drilling activity, all noise will stop until the uh, communities that hunt the bowhead whale in the fall have, have uh, reached their quota. The Inupiat know what can happen if oil drilling is approved. They say they will do everything they can to ensure there's no catastrophe here. Otherwise, they may pay a very high price. It'll be the end of the Inupiat Eskimo culture up here. The last remaining indigenous group
group of people in the United States of America that live the way we do. For This American Land, I'm Bobby Batista. In 2009, Alaska's crude oil production was 236 million barrels, or about 14% of total U.S. production. The Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic may not seem like they have much in common. But the search for oil in both places has created a kinship and a desire to protect both fragile ecosystems. Again, here's Gary Stryker. This reminds me of Exxon Valdez oil spill. We have many miles of our beaches like this. This is where the Gulf of Mexico meets the Arctic in the eyes of a man who has seen the devastation that oil spills can cause. Earl Kingett is one of four native leaders that traveled thousands of miles from their tribes in Alaska to a very different environment in the Gulf, drawn here by the threat and potential consequences of offshore drilling. Oh, that's disgusting. The group made the trip because exploratory drilling is planned in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas off the coast of northern Alaska. It's a very difficult process to respond in a warm climate, and it's going to be impossible in the Arctic. Impossible, they say, because conditions in the Arctic are so much more hostile. By comparison, the Gulf is accessible and has far more resources on hand. That would not be the case in the Arctic. A flyover of the Gulf spill area brought the scale of the disaster home and a feeling of kinship with those suffering below. There is a bond because the people have been impacted, you know, and oil development, there's always going to be an impact of some sort. There's a chance that some of this will make it if it's not a prolonged exposure. The Alaskans were joined by Michael Dardar, a member of a tribe from coastal Louisiana. He gave them a stark warning. My hopes is that they would go back to their home territory and do whatever they can to make sure that the footprint that the oil industry has there is not expanded, that, uh, that they don't have to, to face the things that we've had to face here. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. Samantha Joy is a passionate marine scientist. She studies the natural seepage of oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico, but her research took a dramatic turn after the BP oil disaster. Joy says the impact from this spill will last for years, and much of the devastation is hidden from sight. Miles O'Brien has more in our Science Nation report. The devastation on the water was easy to see. Within weeks of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, University of Georgia marine scientist Samantha Joy and her team were out on the water training their expert eyes under the surface of the Gulf of Mexico, probing the oil and gas plumes floating beneath them. I think that there's going to be a lot of impact from the spill in the deep water and deep sediments. and. I think there might be a lot of gas in the water. 11 o'clock on Sunday, we will be there. Working with a rapid response grant from the National Science Foundation, Joy embarked on a two-week research cruise aboard the science ship Walton Smith. The work and the smells could be intense. Her team tracked a plume about 20 miles long, three miles wide, and hundreds of feet below the surface the gas concentrations are outrageously high. We measure concentrations up to 100,000 times what we typically see in the Gulf of Mexico. Joy says methane gas could create more dead zones in the Gulf by choking off deep water ecosystems. Marine microbes feast on the oil, but in the process, they suck up most of the oxygen, killing plants and animals. Joy is also troubled by the dispersants used to break up the oil. You've already got a big problem. You're, you're spewing oil and gas into the system. Why do you amplify that by adding this unknown? All the researchers say they felt a real sense of urgency when the sampling bottles reached the deck. It was pretty much 
you know, all units to stations, let's get the water, let's start analyzing. One night, one rescued bird put the devastation into perspective for the team. Animals like that bird, whales and sea turtles and fish, and every organism that inhabits the Gulf of Mexico is being exposed to an atrocity. Joy says the oil and gas that cannot be seen is more difficult to track and understand, and diligent ongoing studies of these ecosystems will be crucial to the Gulf's long-term recovery. I'm Miles O'Brien. A story we're working on for an upcoming show, from pythons to lionfish to melaleuca trees, the Florida Everglades are filled with invasive species. We'll show you how scientists are putting the brakes on these aggressors. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of This American Land. You can count on us to bring you original stories about important issues affecting America's natural landscapes, waters, and wildlife. We'll see you next time. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Turner Foundation, the Daniel K. Thorne Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org.